This is Continuum Drag, a weekly podcast where we watch sci-fi, fantasy, and everything in between. This week, Forever Night, Season 2, Episodes 20 and 25. Life will always find a way to cheat death. Life is the enemy we cannot defeat, only cling to like parasites on the living flesh of the universe, hoping that we're not noticed and brushed away with a flick of the hand. Welcome to Continuum Drag, the podcast that has become Jordan's more permanent hell. I'm Luke, here with my co-host Jordan. What's real, Jordan? Uh, you know what? Pretty accurate, because that is what it's like watching this show. At least for me. It's not for you, but for me, it is like hell. <laughs> I, wrote, I wrote a note here. My first note is I wrote, uh, watching Forever Night is like working a tedious, demeaning job day in and day out. That's what I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. But that's what we're watching. We have to do it. That's what we're watching. It's it's what we have to do. It's what we love to yeah. do. It's what we love to do. Well, sometimes we love to do it. Not when it's for ne- forever night, but, you know, other times. <laughs> well, Jordan, I got a game for you to get us started. Wonderful. Just something to cleanse your palate a little, I guess. <laughs> it's, so it's not forever night uh, related? No, it's all forever night related. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's get that taste in your mouth. Okay. What I'm going to do is we're going to play a little game of who did what. <laughs> So I'm going to list all the actors, uh, uh, you know, the regulars, the regulars on the show, and then I'm going to list a bunch of roles they had in other shows, and you're going to see if you can match the actor to the other role they played. Okay. I'm going to say right off the bat, I'm feeling a little lucky. You're feeling lucky. You've been looking at IMDb recently. You've been reading up on everyone's backstories. I I haven't. I just, it's just a feeling. I feel lucky. It's just one of those, like, like someone give me a, give me some dice, you know? (laughs) All right. Jordan's going to win the lottery after he plays Mm -hmm. this game. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, uh, obviously, we'll start with Nick Knight himself. Uh, Grant Wynn Davies is our first yeah. actor. Uh, he's going to be on the list. Little little fun fact for you here about his previous acting career. He has other vampire experience as he played Klaus Van Helsing in Dracula the Series. Really? Dracula the Series? I don't remember that. Dracula the Series. It was two or three years before Forever Night. Really? Yeah, so he got pigeonholed, huh? Yeah, well, he was Klaus Van Helsing, so he wasn't a vampire, I don't think. <laughs> ah, fair enough, fair enough. But he studied under the great, so that's how he got here. <laughs> then there's Dr. Natalie Lambert, played by Catherine Disher. And uh, she's done pretty well for herself. I was looking over her kind of resume, and she's done a ton of acting and voice acting. She used to split her time between the two. And I'm just mm-hmm. like, that must have like earned her a very comfortable living. I think voice acting's where it's at. You just go into a booth in sweatpants, and you're like, "Hey, Jiminy Crickets, I'm a, I'm a lovable bear, or whatever, you know." And then you, you clock out. I know, right? But she's still even acting because she's done 76 episodes of The Good Witch, which is six more episodes than she's done of The Good Night or of The Good Night, <laughs> The Nick Night, Forever Night, Forever Night. There we go, Forever Night. So, so what you're saying is, when she goes to those uh, fan conventions, there's more like like witch heads than there is uh, night heads. Yeah, I would say she's now probably on two like very popular kind of uh, series in a very similar vein and genre, I'd say. Good for her. Absolutely. There's then LaCroix. LaCroix? LaCroix. Something like that. Nigel Bennett. Yeah, we've never decided. No, I will never decide. And, of course, he's a long-running Canadian character actor. We've seen him in a ton of stuff. You may have seen him at home in uh, Benicio Del Toro's The Shape of Water. Yeah, I know I've seen him before. I can't remember in that particular movie, though. Yeah, yeah, he's in there somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he like just walks in and like tips his hat and he's like good day sir and i'm like ah there's old nigel i think he works at the factory his character has a, like a mister name so i'm assuming mm-hmm. he works at the factory he's got a good face like he's got a real uh, del-, del toro face i feel like yeah oh and I, I have to say he's i think he's one of the better uh characters in this show like i think he does a lot with very little for uh, his lacroix character lacroix whatever his name is and then of course there's jeanette de charme that's her mm-hmm. full name apparently deborah uh I'm going to mispronounce this, but Duchenne? Duchenne? Something like that. Duchenne? Duchenne, thank you. Uh, Deborah Duchenne. um, And she kind of left acting immediately after Forever Night, so there's not a lot to talk about in her career. Um, You know, sometimes people just get over it, I think, and just move on to other things. I think she and I just feel the same way. She's just like, ugh, I can't take this anymore. And then, of course, there's Detective Don Skanky, played by John... Uh, Capolis? Yeah. Is that how you'd say it? I think it's Capolis, yeah. 
I think I think uh, Steve was pronouncing it differently, but I think it's Kapalos. Kapalos, John Kapalos. Um, and of course, you may have seen him at home more recently in the Umbrella Academy as Jack Ruby. Mm. All right. So those are our those are our five sort of leads. Okay. And uh, I'll give you some roles they may have been in, and see if you can pair them together. Okay. Okay. Do you want the yeah. role, and then do you want to guess who goes with it, or do you want all the roles first? Give me all the roles if you don't mind. You got it. So there is, of course, the character Doctor Whitney in the Joshua Jackson Paul Walker classic, The Skulls. Oh, I never saw that. And it's Doctor Whitney. Doctor Whitney. Okay. There's Dino. From John Hughes' Weird Science. <laughs> okay. It's been a long time since I've seen that. There's Major Rivers in Airwolf with uh, Barry Van Dyke from Galactica 1980. Oh, yeah. Airwolf. I forgot about that show. Um, there is the character Mather in one episode of the Jerry O'Connell starring series My Secret Identity. What was the, uh, sorry, what was the, uh, the name of the character? Mather. Mather. Okay. And then there is... Soapy in TNT, a Mr. T private eye show. <laughs> I don't remember that at all. I was a big Mr. T fan. It went for many seasons. <laughs> wow, good for him. Okay, so those are those are all the shows, huh? It was also shot in Toronto. Yeah, I see. I seem like most of these were. Um, what was the what was your uh, the first one again? Actor or role? Role. It was Doctor Whitney and the Skulls. Okay, Doctor Whitney and the Skulls. I'm gonna give that to. Um, uh, 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 that's going to go to uh, Na- whoever played Natalie. I can't remember her name. Okay. And what's the second movie? The second movie was Dino, the role of Dino in Weird Science. Oh, uh, Dino in Weird Science. I'm going to say that was John Kapalos. Okay. Was her third one? That was Major Rivers in Airwolf. Oh. Uh, that's going to be uh, Ger- Geraint, Durant, w- Wills Davies, whatever his name is. <laughs> Win-, Win Davies. That's the one. Yeah, yeah. Him. And what's our fourth one? Was that Secret Identity? Mather in My Secret Identity? Yeah, that's LaCroix. And finally, Soapy in TNT. Who do I have left? That's Jeanette, right? That's the only one I have left? That's the only one you have left. That's what I'm That's what I'm going for. Five for five. Well, Jordan, you have two out of five. <laughs> Wait a minute. I thought I was supposed to get all of them. I don't know. Talk to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Which ones were they? Well, you were correct about uh, Grant Wynn Davies or Gra- Grant Wynn Davies. Oh, we're going to mm. get so many letters about our pronunciation. Durant, Grant, yeah. Durant, maybe? He was uh, Major Rivers in the Airwolf series with um, old Barry, Barry Von Dyke. Mm-hmm. Van Vaughn, whatever. My pronunciation's all over the place. <laughs> and you were correct about um, John Kapalos. He was a Dino in Weird Science. You know what's funny? Those are the only two I was confident about. Oh, yeah? Did you know that uh, old John Kapalos has a long-running career with John Hughes? I did not. Oh, I know that he plays the janitor in um, uh, um, uh, Breakfast Club. I knew that. Oh, well, he's also in 16 Candles. Oh, is he? Oh, I didn't know that. So he had a real run with uh, old John Hughes for a while there. Where you were incorrect, however, though, was Dr. Natalie Lambert, Catherine Disher. She was in TNT with Mr. T. TNT with Mr. T. LaCroix, Nigel Bennett, he was Dr. Whitney in the Skulls. Yeah, I should have known. He, he's, he, 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 he's, 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 he, we wouldn't have put two, uh, two doctor roles for Natalie. I fell for that. <laughs> and Jeanette was, uh, Deborah du- De- Jeanette or Deborah Duchesne was in, uh, My Secret Identity for an episode. Oh, look at that. Do you watch uh, My Secret Identity? I remember it was on TV. I remember him. He had like two spray bottles, right? Like little hairspray bottles and he used them to fly yeah. somehow. He, uh, he, that was what he used to like uh, for direction. Because when, when you're in the air, how do you direct yourself? So he would use spray cans. Oh, I thought he was using those to fly as a child. I know. A lot of, a lot of people thought that. I think, I think a lot of people watching that show thought that's how he flew. It seemed like that. But, well, you know, maybe it wasn't the clearest uh, clearest intention for what his superpowers were, which I still don't know. I think I confuse him. I think I think he's a teenage doctor who can also fly. So I think I'm combining that with Doogie Howser. I think he's similar to Brave Star. He's got, like, a lot of powers. Do you remember Brave Star? <laughs> That's all this show's going to be. Me I don't know what Brave Star is, I'm afraid. It was a, he was like a, a indigenous cowboy cartoon in the late 80s, early 90s. Hmm. Never heard of it. <laughs> Brave Star. He had like like a vision of a hawk and like speed of a cheetah. Everything was animal related. All his powers. Right, right, right. It was very sensitive portrayal of indigenous people, right? 
Uh, perhaps not. I can't remember. I'm going to guess probably not. <laughs> well, Jordan, now that you've got a taste, you're ready to go for some from our forever night. Should we get into the first episode? Yeah, we should. And let me just mention, um, I watched these out of order. This is the first time ever in 200 something episodes. I watched these accidentally out of order. Um, it doesn't matter. <laughs> How did you manage that? I mean, I sent you a list where they were in order. <laughs> It, I just, I, I labeled the files wrong. That's all. <laughs> Anyways, doesn't matter. Here's the INDB summary for season two, episode 20, A More Permanent Hell. When Nick Knight goes to investigate the alleged suicide of a space scientist, he discovers that an asteroid is heading for Earth and is projected to strike within three months. Mm-hmm. Hey, let me just say, do you notice John Capolis directed this episode? I did. It was a John Capolis special. Yeah, I was very excited. Good for him. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, you know what? Pretty good. Yeah, absolutely. It opens yeah. at an observatory where three astronomers, or if you'll believe the opening, space scientists. <laughs> space scientists. Did that make you laugh? It did. I love the idea. It's, you know, space scientists. Whatever the whatever they do. <laughs> I, I just, it, for me, it's just symptomatic of this show. They're just like, close enough. <laughs> space scientist. Close enough. Don't do any research. They're in shock over a discovery they've made that an asteroid is going to strike the Earth in three months. And... Uh, it's very funny. They've got three actors playing these scientists, and one of them is like a Canadian classic character actor. He's always playing like weird characters. Julian Richling. I, I'm sure you noticed him. Yeah, Julian Richings. He looks like he'd play a great scientist every time. Yeah, yeah. And I was just like, oh, what a great piece of casting. This is awesome. Of the three scientists, he's definitely going to be our lead scientist. Never see him again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, isn't that odd? He like shows up at the beginning, and then does he even come? I think they question him, and that's it, right? Yeah, then you never see him again beyond the opening. And I was just like, I guess this was very early in his career before they realized you got to keep Julian Richling on screen at all times. Yeah, I think what it was is he was doing this and, uh, I don't know, some other Canadian show at the same time. He's like, I, I can get you till 2 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> but these three scientists have discovered this. And one of the scientists, she can't, she can't take it anymore. So when the other two leave the room, she blows her brains out. <laughs> It was so dark, but it was it was it was done in a way that at first I didn't really know what happened. It also could be because I was only partially paying attention. But they like leave the two doctors go out for like a smoke or something, and then they're like, "Ah, oh, something happened inside." Did you actually hear the gunshot? Well, I think the problem is the sound effect they use for the gunshot is a gust of wind. So I was like, what "Right." Happened? I just knew something bad had happened, and then they sort of like go to credits, and then you find out that this woman has killed herself. You're like, "Oh, that's not funny at all." No, no. And, of course, Nick, Skanky, and Dr. Nat arrive to investigate. And, you know, the scientists are a little wary to tell them about their discovery. And they're just like, listen, if we tell you what's going on, you're going to have to keep it a secret. And then, like, Skanky, because he's great, just like, no, I don't have to do anything. I'm a cop. You have to tell me what happened. And they're like, oh, I guess so. Well, and this raises an interesting question, because the secret that we are going to find out, which is um, uh, the information that sort of propels this uh, episode, which is, uh, these scientists have uh, discovered that there's a meteor and this meteor is on a collision course with Earth and it's not like a small meteor. It's going to uh, sustain a large portion of its size, meaning that it's going to uh, smash into Earth and end all life as we know it. It's the apocalypse. It's the apocalypse. But before we get into more of that, this becomes a little kind of a running, in some way, a running thing for a part of the episode that they're like, okay, we're going to tell you this, but you can't tell anyone. And the cops are like, okay, but like, c can you do that? Can you, can you make a discovery that, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it, is, is that a moral thing to say, well, we just don't want people to know because we don't want there to be a panic? I mean, I thought it was semi-reasonable. I mean, the fact that the police are there, I think you're kind of on the hook to tell them what happened. But, you know, they're just concerned because rightly so. They know a panic could break out. And, you know, they tell them about the asteroid and then Earth basically has three months to live. And as soon as they leave, the, the police, like, just leave some, like, you know, regular officers to guard the scene. And, like, as soon as they leave, we see a, a police officer who's at the scene. He picks up the phone and he's just like, you'll never guess what I heard. <laughs> and immediately new word gets out. But as a scientist, don't you have a moral obligation or even a legal obligation to, to tell people if you've found something like that that is catastrophic and, and concerns the entire world? I guess so. I think what's sort of supposed to be the idea is, and they, and they bring this up because they say they've called York University to double check the findings. But I think there's this this concept that maybe they're, they want to they wanna get a couple more looks at this before they let the word out. Mm, okay, that's fair. But yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. Do scientists have the right to not tell us we're going to die? Yeah, it just seems like, I don't know. 
I think I think you kind of should. You know. Yeah, you think if some guy in an astronomy place finds an asteroid, he's just get on Twitter and say, "Yo, yo, gonna die soon, everybody." Well, maybe not like that. <laughs> I don't know if it should, <laughs> should start with "yo, yo," but I think it'd be like, "Hey, uh, rest of scientific community, do you want to look into this? Because this is a little bit alarming." Yeah, yeah. I mean, they kind of do that. I did like that York University came involved in this, so I was just like, you know, we're in Toronto now. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why you'd go to York, but anyways, a little slam on York. <laughs> they make the best space scientists there. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, at York they call them space scientists. <laughs> but this results in just like riots on TV immediately. Like we just see like the world is immediately falling into chaos. Mm-hmm. The morgues are overflowing with murder, suicides, and vampire bites. It's so funny. Yeah, I like I like that. That that's the thing. It's like it's suicides, like and vampires. Like oh yeah, I guess that's a problem because Natalie's like, how am I gonna like hide these vampire bites for a while? Because like, she's got like dozens of people that have been eat, killed by vampires. But I mean, it's not so hard for her because basically everybody's also stopped showing up to work. It's amazing. Like they go from zero to a hundred in about thirty seconds. Like the world falls apart instantaneously, and I loved it. I'm just like, all right, great. The world's already it's over. Like everyone's riding. They're murdering each other. Thousands and thousands are apparently dying in Toronto alone. <laughs> yeah, and you, maybe this is unfair. I actually thought it was a good idea. I just, I don't know. I wish they could have done a little bit more with that idea of like, and obviously this budgetary restraints. You can't show all this chaos. But I think it is an interesting like setup for things. And it's kind of just simmering in the background. Whereas I thought they could do a little more with it. Yeah, I don't know. It's a, It's an interesting concept for sure. I was like... I was very happy just to be like, we're getting into it right now. The world is ending and we're not even like, we're not like hiding it from people. We're letting it out immediately. And like, that's just where the world of this episode is going to be. And I'm like, okay. Cause like the police are taken over by the army, like martial laws declared. And like basically every character's like story this episode, except, (laughs) except for, except for Nick. Uh, But everyone else's uh, episode character is just confronting their own mortality. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, because it goes right away. I don't know if it's the next scene, but there's like a, a, a extended like driving sequence where like Skanky's basically like, "Why would God allow this to happen?" and and Nick's just like, "I don't know, I'm a vampire," you know, and they <laughs> and they talk about that for a while. <laughs> I'm gonna jump around a lot this episode because there's just a lot of little threads that run through it. But sure. what I was most excited about, and I'm sure you were not, I'm sure this was the opposite of excitement for you, was that we know Lacroix's back, but what we find out is that. He's back at his late night radio show as DJ Nightcrawler. <laughs> I knew you'd like that. It is funny because I think we talked about how it was odd that he was doing that. We were wondering um, if he had been kind of doing it for weeks before uh, Nick heard it. But apparently, yeah, he that's like his job, I guess. He, he does do the night shift. And Nick listens constantly because he has, I suppose he's drawn, because he's still drawn to LaCroix as his like master or his maker. So he's still like... I guess is compelled to listen. Is, did you get that? Yeah, yeah. They're still bros. He wants to. He wants to be friends with him, but it's hard. It's one of those toxic friendships. And I want to make one other uh, quick note. You mentioned that you know we find out that people are not going to work uh, very quickly. Uh, and the, and when Natalie was uh, in the morgue, she's like, "No one's coming to work, and it's just me. I'm the only one here." And the first thing I thought was, "Well, you just keep arresting people." Like, remember the last episode? The guy that worked with her was a murderer. Oh yeah. I'm like, well, that's why there's no one left. In, there's no one left in the morgue. They're all they're all murderers. You think it's a toxic worst place. That's yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's not that the world's ending. They just don't want to work on that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's a different theory I have. Well, let's get back to LaCroix for a second on his radio show. Sure. Because uh, his got a little B plot here or a C plot. It's just everyone's got their own little threads, basically. And for him finding out the world's going to end, his concern is more about him as a vampire. And him specifically, not just a new vampire like, say, Nick or Jeanette, but he's apparently an quote-unquote ancient vampire. And Mm -hmm. ancient vampires apparently will have a bit more trouble in the apocalypse. Like, the theory is, I guess they sort of lay out, is that when the apocalypse happens, obviously all the humans will die. But then the vampires will continue on because they don't die that easily. The young vampires like Nick and Jeanette, they'll eventually starve to death. But an ancient vampire like LaCroix, he's going to end up wandering a barren earth for uh, centuries or something. I, he has a great line here where he talks about how this is going to happen. And I believe the line is the, also the title of the episode where he says that he's been, quote, delivered from death to a more permanent hell. Yeah. Which is, which by the way, uh, the title uh, gets one point because it's a great title for an episode. But this, you kind of find this out very, very 
late into the episode that because they kept saying there's gonna be we'll talk about it, natalie's plot line and the discussion of vampires not dying because the first thing i thought was like well of course all the vampires are gonna die they have no source of food anymore if everyone's gone and they sort of as you said sort of address that with the exception of these uh, old old vampires but even still like uh, vampires must have to have some sort of environment to be able to survive, right? Like, do you know what I mean? Like, if it's just, if, I don't know, maybe maybe I'm wrong, but it just seemed like, well, it's not even, I, I can't even see him existing, what, just like floating around in lava? That That's what he does? Yeah, I guess so. He's just walking around in lava. Oh, okay. I mean, he survived that stake to the heart and burning to death at the beginning of season one, so, I mean, it's hard to kill him. I suppose that's true. I really took this as a way of them explaining a little further as to why he's not dead. He's just like, he's just impossible to kill because he's an ancient vampire. It's true. I guess I never really thought of it. that. It, it is an easy way of kind of retconning things and being like, yeah, he's so old, you just can't kill him. Which, don't you think it would have come up at some point with conversations with Nick? Like over like a couple hundred years, he'd be like, hey, by the way, do you know you like, absolutely can't kill me? Like they must have had fun with that at some point. They weren't, they weren't really bored in the 1800s. He's like, come on, kill me. <laughs> They have some drinks, they play some Russian roulette, they have some fun. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, what this plotline does lead to is is the fun part for LaCroix this episode. Is he gets some flashbacks, and we get to learn how LaCroix was turned into a vampire. <laughs> yeah, in Pompeii. <laughs> Such a great reveal. Turns out he is a ruthless Roman Roman genera- general, sorry, a ruthless Roman general in the uh, Ga- uh, Gallic Wars. He was fighting the Gauls. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he's he's like he's quite arrogant, and he oh, when we first see him, he's uh he's kind of look, looking at this um bust, this sculpture that's been made of him, and he's like, ooh, look at me. And we had to learn his original name, General Lucius. That's right. <laughs> it went from Lucius to Lacroix or Lacroix. I don't know how he pronounces it. But yeah, he's returned home from the battles, and he he's happy to be back. And they're in Pompeii. It's a great reveal when they just like they're at this party, and as it ends, they're like, "Welcome home to." Pompeii and then it like cuts the commercial and you're like oh no yeah. Vesuvius hasn't exploded yet yeah because everyone's just like we know what's gonna happen um and what we kind of discover through this flashback is he's he's a mortal general he's very ruthless did a lot of awful things um but he also had an illegitimate daughter back in old Pompeii I didn't really mm-hmm. care much for her but like he was talking to the mother and kind of he'd heard that his illegitimate daughter had been sick and he kind of was just like, he didn't care that much, but he was checking up. And the mother's just like, ah, don't worry about it. Some ancient healer rolled through town. She's better now. Sure, she only goes out at night and she's really pale, but ah, she's better, basically. Yeah. And uh, let me just say a really weird little thing. This person who, uh, this actress who played this role, I met her as a teenager just at, through someone else. And it was one of these weird things where I don't know her well. I've met her one time. But I saw her and I was like, I know this person from somewhere. And I looked her up. I was like, oh, it's that girl I met one time in like 1996. <laughs> just after she did this role. Just after she did this. Yeah. Anyways, we were we were just kids. But yes, uh, apparently his illegitimate daughter has become a vampire back in Roman times. And you know what? This is great. I, I always love a kid vampire. It's always fun to see a kid <laughs> vampire. The implications are always hilarious. Well, that's what I was going to say, because it's always awful to be a kid vampire, right? Yeah, it's the it's kind of the fun you have. Anytime you get a kid vampire introduced, you're like, oh, I'm going to live forever, but be a child. That's always the worst. That's always a plot line. Luke, if you were a kid vampire, would you refer to it as a more permanent hell? Mm, interesting. I'd pro- <laughs> refer to it as a more permanent uh, kindergarten. Mm, nice. Is that good? I don't know. That's pretty good. <laughs> but anyway... We pretty much know where this is headed, and uh, as the flashbacks continue throughout the episode, what we see is Mount Vesuvius erupts, his house is falling down around him, and his his daughter shows up and basically is like, offers him life or death, and of course, he doesn't, you know, it's not a clear thing as being offered vampirism, but he of course doesn't want to die, he's too, he's, he's calling out God for trying to kill such a great general like him, and Kid Vampire bites him, and we get to see that this is how LaCroix became a vampire. Mm-hmm. But did it ever uh, explain how a uh, stepdaughter became a vampire? Yeah, they said she was sick, um, and then an ancient healer came through town and like cured mm-hmm. her of what, what everyone, all the other healers thought was a incurable disease. But you know, she's been really weird since then. And I think the idea being just like an even uh, like an old vampire came through and uh, helped out the mom. What a shtick he has, huh? He's like, oh, I'm a healer, and he just he just turns people to vampires. Yeah, it's a good deal. <laughs> I guess. I guess. So, hey, all question, the blood though, you want. do you think she's coming back? Because if, uh, what's his face, LaCroix, LaCroix is so hard to kill and he's been around forever, she's even older than him. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good setup. Like, honestly, as soon as I saw it, I was like, can't wait for the episode where his really, really old daughter comes back and is just like, 
having a bad relationship with her dad. Like, I'm just like, there's a lot of opportunity here. Happy to see it. I can't wait for more. Yeah. yeah. We'll see if it happens. I mean, I don't know. We probably won't find it in the few episodes of this show- series we're watching. I don't know if it's out there. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. Well, it could always be your fan fiction. They, oh, there's definitely fan fiction about it for sure, right? <laughs> At any rate, Dr. Nate is having her own little storyline. Dr. Nate, Dr. Nat. <laughs> Natalie, yeah. My pronunciation is a mess today. <laughs> Dr. Natalie. She doesn't want to die. She's very upset that the world is ending, and she'd rather take her chances in the post-apocalypse remains of the world as a vampire. But when she brings it up to Nick, he won't won't bring her to their side. He's not going to turn her into a vampire. So (laughs) Natalie decides she'll just go to the vamp bar, the Raven, and just start to party and hope some vampire there will, uh, you know, bite her neck and turn her into a vampire for her. Well, this was the part I was a little confused. I actually think this is one of the more interesting of these plot lines i didn't really care about Lacroix becoming a vampire um but the idea of like she's so um uh, uh worried about the end of the world and her own mortality that she's like i'll become a vampire but i don't know how much she knows about vampires or how much nick has told her but like has there been any indication that being a vampire would survive the apocalypse do you mean like she just is like well like it's like everyone just understood that like but i was like my first thought was why would vampires survive right because even even from what we've learned she's going to survive what a couple weeks <laughs> i mean i think what it is is she's just desperate and i think the idea is that i guess they won't die due to the actual like impact they're too immortal apparently you you know they can only die by the cutting off of heads or stabbing through hearts or whatever the basic vampire things are so i guess the idea is just like they're guaranteed survival and Nat does make a bit of a speech where she's just like, she's not so grim about it. She just figures that vampires will just rebuild a new society. It'll be different than it was before. And they'll like, I don't know, create synthetic. Well, she kind of gives a speech about how she thinks it's just like the evolution of mankind will happen. Why she's so positive. Maybe it's just desperation. But yeah, it, you know, she's just she just doesn't want to die, I guess. Yeah, the important part, uh, point, important point is that she goes to the the one vampire club, which is Jeanette's club. What's it called? The Raven? The Raven. Yeah, the Raven. And she goes there and basically it's like she's just, she's just trying to like pick up people. And again, I almost thought this would be a, a good episode in itself of just, you know, somewhat she's dying or whatever, thinks she's dying. And, and the the actions one goes through when uh, they're in that mindset. And, and the idea of like just trying to pick up vampires was pretty good. Did you like how she was dancing at the club? Of course. Yeah, I, I thought she had the moves. She pinches her nose puts her hand over her head and then goes down like she's diving in the middle of dancing in the club. And I laughed so hard. Well, I mean, and also just everyone is everyone at the club of vampire. I think it's a high, a high percentage. <laughs> okay. Cause it looks like a high percentage. They all just look like, I'm just saying for them not being vampires, they're doing a bad, a pretty bad job of hiding it. I thought it was really amazing that she met a vampire that had the same uh, name you would pick if you were a vampire. What was his name again? Oh, wait, hold on. I have it written down. It's, um, it's spark, right? Yep, Spark the Vampire. Spark. <laughs> I wouldn't pick Spark. I'd pick Old like... Old uh, Spark the Vampire. <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd pick like uh, 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 Juice Box. Juice Box? Yeah, you, yeah, Juice Box and Spark would hang out. <laughs> You're Spark. And she, you know, she's kind of getting into a Spark, and then she sort of has some like, you know, as you do in these shows, she's like starts regretting maybe she's not ready to do this. And it's, you know... A, a, a metaphor for consent basically she yeah. she withdraws her consent from uh, from old spark but he he's it's he's it's gone too far he's ready for that blood yeah so question uh vampires are rapists yeah i think generally that is the how vampires are uh, handled okay yeah cuz i was like oh he's 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 a rapist yeah generally i i guess that's true that is the vampire mythology my friend <laughs> <laughs> i thought maybe they asked I think the good ones like Nick do, and that's why they're so romantic. <laughs> that's right. You're you're right. I, 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 you're right. You got it all. You got it all. You know it all. Your objection is withdrawn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he is very romantic. Um, and they end up back at her apartment. You know, there's this threat: is is Spark going to turn Nat into a vampire and drink her blood? Um, but you know. Somebody, I believe Jeanette calls Nick's cell phone and just like, hey, I can't find your friend who's here at the bar, but I think she went home with Spark. And he says, like, not Spark. <laughs> and, of course, Nick flies across the city, smashes yeah. through her apartment window. And, like, 
I believe he fights he fights Spark. I think they break every window in her apartment during the fight. Yes, I thought that was funny, is that Nick comes in to save the day, but costs her, I don't know, thousands of dollars in damage. I'm like, Nick, just like take the guy out quickly. And I was like, you're in an apartment building. You know how long it's going to take to get all those windows fixed? It's going to be a disaster in there. I mean, to be fair, it's better than the alternative. But yes, there's a lot of damage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At any rate, Nat is saved from being a vampire. And I mean, as we know, it's a long-running series. So I'm sure it's not a spoiler to know that the world is not going to end by the end of the episode. But there's a weird bit at the end here where what we see is Nat's been saved from becoming a vampire. And... At the end of the episode, she walks in and sees Nick, and she starts pouting really hard at him. And I wasn't sure what her like. She's not grateful. She's still mad at Nick for something, like, but not mad enough to say anything. She just sort of pouts in his general direction. And I was like, is this supposed to be like she's mad at him for not doing it himself because they're sort of in love? Or I just couldn't figure out why she was so like pouty at the end of the episode about it. I think it was just that he, when she was at her lowest and she needed him uh, to help her, he denied it. Whether mm. that was whether that was something that was good for her or not, I think she's having in uh, there's an inability of her to see that the ends justify the means for him. Right? That that right, right, right. You know, she's, I think that's just that she's like, I wanted you to be there for me, and you weren't, regardless of whether you were right or not. Yeah, maybe you're not as good a friend as I thought you were. Exactly. Well, it is enough. weird, though. There is a part where, um, uh, not to get too much into it, but when she first asks him um, to make her a vampire as well, she's like, I'll give you what you've always kind of wanted, sort of implying that, like, she'll have sex with him if he makes her a vampire. And I was like, oh, was that something he always wanted? I didn't know there was even, a, like, a, a, a will there, won't they with those two. Mm, I thought it was just, like, blood. I thought she just meant blood. <laughs> Oh, see, yeah, well, maybe, maybe, maybe you're right. I, I thought they had to imply that it was like it was a sexual thing, and I was like, well, that's weird. She's like, I've been, I've been holding my feminine wiles over you for ages, <laughs> and now you, can yeah, me. that's why I was like, oh, I haven't seen that at all. But sure, okay, you do you, Natalie. I think she's just walking around. She like pricks her finger down, and then goes, mm, it looks so tasty, Nick. Sorry, you can't have any. <laughs> well, that's not nice. <laughs> maybe they have a toxic friendship. <laughs> she knows he's at home drinking that cow's blood. <laughs> he's not using it. For, he's not using it for paint thickener. We all know that. He's thickening up all that paint with that blood. Yeah. I, this is this is a little uh, treat for next episode. But we learn we learn next episode that he learned that trick for flickering paint blood from Raphael. And I was just like, I'm glad uh, I learned that information. <laughs> don't you hate that? I think we've talked about it before. But why everyone who's lived hundreds of years has to have like bumped into famous figures? It's just like, come on. I mean, Jordan, you've only lived for what forty years. Yeah, and I bumped into the person that was played uh, uh, the stepdaughter of... <laughs> exactly, it happens, it happens, <laughs> Jordan. Again, I, uh, I, uh, I, I bow to you. <laughs> anyway, let's get back to the actual plot of the episode. Those are kind of the little weird sea lines that run through it. But the world's coming apart, and Nick is in charge of this investigation to the suicide. You know... The world's falling apart and everyone kind of is just like, maybe we should just move away. Everything looks like it's a suicide. Maybe it's time to put this like case on the back burner. But Nick Nick has a feeling something doesn't feel right about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's like, it's it, you mentioned before that they all have their plot line. And it's weird because I don't know if they quite coalesce into something that is, you know, greater than some of its parts. But his plot line is basically like, he doesn't believe that the suicide is a suicide because he has a feeling. Now, I don't know if they really end, ever indicate what it exactly is he just sort of is like "Mm, it just doesn't add up but like to be fair all the evidence does add up like obviously we're gonna learn of course it's nick of course he's the best cop of course he's right because he needs a plot line but i kind of would have almost liked him to be wrong because everything's sort of planted almost like the idea of like for whatever reason he didn't want to admit that this person had killed themselves maybe because it shows something about himself or something he's learned in his past i thought there was they could have played with something interesting as opposed to like he's just a good cop even though no real reason well i mean to be fair she did kill herself and uh there is nothing nefarious about her suicide (laughs) well that's what i mean so it's like there's no reason for him other than his like uh his like feeling you know what i mean yeah 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 i mean someone needs to keep the the plot going i guess and nick is saddled with that um because stanky for stanky shanky skanky Skanky. yeah (laughs) it's a terrible day rough day for me uh skanky (laughs) 
his most of his episode will also be kind of like being worried about dying and all that stuff. Yeah. But there's also his weird little thing is he keeps talking about his cousin, the investment broker, and apparently just before the apocalypse, he invested some money with his cousin. He's trying to talk Nick into doing it too at the beginning of the episode, and I thought it was gonna be a pyramid scheme. But what it really <laughs> is about is that even as the world comes to an end. These investment bankers, they can't stop making money. Skank even makes $5,000 on the investment he did. Yeah, I knew it was going to be a larger thing because it just was such an odd thing to add into this episode because they kept going back to it where Skanky's like, uh, the stock market, I, lo- I won $5,000 because I'm, you know, uh, I'm betting short against the market. And then he's like, it kind of keeps coming up. And I'm like, oh, I see where this is going. Like, it doesn't take a detective to figure it out. But um, but it was not a not a bad idea. Yeah, it's it's like the theory they sort of lay out is just like even as the world ends, like these greedy Wall Street types are going to make a buck off of it. And as Skanky keeps bringing this up, it kind of reminds Nick uh, of one of the things one of the space scientists said was about her real estate investor husband who worked in New York and hadn't hadn't come back to be with her yet during the apocalypse. And this this causes him to return to the observatory and they they check out her computer and my God, Jordan, that computer has a modem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was great. And she's been using a stock tracking program to send data to her husband in New York. And he's been using that data to make money off the real estate market during the apocalypse, I guess, is the idea. And yeah. they essentially are able to determine that the astronomer created this uh, asteroid collision hoax by falsifying the trajectory of the asteroid by, quote, an arc second. Yeah, so basically they were like, we're going to make a bunch of money on the stock market and then pull out before everyone realizes it's a hoax, correct? Yeah, that's the idea. They're basically yeah. causing an apocalypse to make money, killing tens of thousands, possibly <laughs> yeah. hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. Just so they can make like, you know, a couple million dollars off of it. Yeah. Well, there's no way they're going to make it out. Like someone would track this. I mean, it is very funny. Someone's going to go back and be like, when it goes by, they're going to look at those those uh, those yeah. those things that they're, they're researching and be like, oh, I see where the issue is here. You faked it? Yeah, exactly. At any rate, Nick has saved the day, sort of. I mean, it's one of my favorite parts of this episode. It's just like the ramifications to the planet and like the populace are just catastrophic apocalypse or not. Like awful things have happened to every segment of the population. And uh, Nick has solved the crime. So it's sort of like all's well that ends well. Like we cut back to the precinct and there's balloons up and they're throwing a little the world didn't yeah. end party. But I'm just like, I think you guys still have a lot of work to do. What with the bodies piling up in your morgue? <laughs> yeah, it is funny. I think that is maybe part of why they're like, just like we'll mention stuff's happening. and We'll kind of show it in the news, but we don't really see the implications of that because it just opens up big problem you know when it's like oh well the rest of the show is just them dealing with the lawlessness that won't stop in the society yeah the rest of the show is the uh, hbo's the leftovers just like everyone left over after this tragedy (laughs) that's right exactly um but that pretty much is the end of the uh, end of the world of this episode so uh should we get into the next episode yeah let's do it here's the imdb summary for season two episode 25 close call okay I'm here because I want to talk about Nicholas. What do you want to know? Okay. Is he a... Is he a vampire? Are you? You tell me. Skanky questions Nick's abilities and investigates his seemingly superhuman powers. Now, Luke, how long did it take you to realize this was a clip show? And second question, how long did it take you to realize I'd be furious that it's a clip show? I would say probably in the first 10 minutes, I started realizing this is like a semi-clip show. And as soon as I realized that, I was like, Jordan's just flipping a table somewhere. (laughs) Yeah, both of those are true. I also, it took me, it wasn't as fast because at first, I have to say, they, they structured this pretty well for a for a clip show at least for the first like 10 15 minutes then it's just is like showing clips of clips and then clips from the same episode you're just watching but for the first bit i was like okay this is an okay structure and then it just it's the worst episode ever it's a light clip show for sure like they show a few clips from other episodes but they're really short they're really sparse and they do tend to actually cut to flashbacks from within his own episode at some point so it's just like it feels more like they had to do 
a light bottle episode with like extra footage. Like, it's just like they never commit to full clip show, but they never like really don't commit to clip show. It's an odd clip show. It almost felt more to me like it's a clip show that they, for some reason, didn't have enough clips. But I was like, you guys have a ton of episodes. But didn't it feel like it didn't feel like it felt like they were like, oh, what do we cut to? Uh, just something from this episode. I'm like, well, what, why are we doing a clip show at all? Yeah, they have like 40 episodes at this point. And that's the thing. It's like, I don't think it's a clip show. I think they at some point were like, maybe it'll be a clip show and then talked themselves out of it. But still were like, well, we got to keep cutting to memories. Honestly, I would say in the clip show, we see two, maybe three episodes that you and I have never watched before. But other yeah. than that, we see pilot stuff. We see clips from this episode itself. And then I think maybe a clip from an episode we've watched. So it's not like they're going to a ton of episodes. It's more like they need to cut to something for Skanky to have a memory. And they, they don't want to linger on it very long. How crazy is it, though, that they cut to the pilot, which we watched? You know, of all the episodes. They cut to the pilot. They cut to the episode where Nick was arrested and they find the blood in the right. and talk about the blood thickening agent. That comes up two or three times. So it is weird. Like the episodes they choose are ones we've already seen. It is funny, though, that you and I'm not even disagreeing that it's maybe not um, a clip show in the traditional sense, but I almost feel like what it more shows is how uh, uh, not essential so many of these episodes are, that the ones we watched are really all you need to see and you kind of get the basic universe. I'll say what I thought was just like, man, oh, man, the edit schedule on this must be like insane. So the editor doesn't even have time to go back and like watch old episodes to find clips. He's like, I just got to pull what I can pull. Uh, it's easier to pull from this episode because I know what the I know what the footage is. That's funny. I didn't even think of that. Anyway, it opens with Skanky. He, he's chasing down a man who's got a high powered automatic rifle that has both a like high powered scope and a laser sight on it. This man is like prepared for all forms of warfare. Yeah, I figure if you have, like, a, a machine gun of sorts, you don't really need a scope. Like, you're fine. You just shoot blindly, you know? It's 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 very funny. And it's just, like, it's like a real, like, 80s, 90s action movie trope, which is, like, the biggest gun they could find. They're like, give it to him. He's the bad guy. Yeah, but what we basically get is that um, uh, Skanky and Nick, who we will see, are sort of following this guy. They get into a shootout. Um, it gets to the point where Skanky's kind of cornered, and he's going for the guy, and Nick uses his vampire powers to sort of fly in from the um, uh, the fire escape to sort of stop and, and knock the guy down. But in doing so, he shows Skanky more than he wanted to, which is some of his powers. Like, there's no way he would be able to get from such a high um, high place down in, in such a fast time. So Skanky's like, how did this happen? And it's sort of like he's unintentionally revealed his secret identity, sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Skanky's able to see something odd. I mean, he doesn't see the flight, but he does see that, like, he's done something that he couldn't possibly, a human couldn't possibly have done. Mm -hmm. And in in the course of this, too, I have to say, because Skanky is the one who ends up shooting this guy at some point. Um, Like, the guy guy quick draws on Skanky, and Skanky's a better shot and, like, blows away the uh, gunman. And Nick only has to intervene when the gunman's not entirely dead and, like, stands back up or something. Yeah. Because there's also this subtext of Skanky was involved in, like, a, a police shooting, basically. So he's got a lot of paperwork to fail out around it. Well, I, I'll got to say also, uh, and not that this makes me a genius, but I think anyone can watch this that knows where this is going to go. Because they keep kind of pushing that fact of, like, Skanky, shouldn't you be, like, emotional about the shooting you just did? And shouldn't you, don't you feel, like, bad about it? And don't you need to, like, see a therapist and stuff? He's like, no, I'm fine. And I was like, oh, I see how they're going to resolve all this. I, 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 it, 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 it's, it's pretty much told from the first couple minutes. I mean, it's fine. Jordan, he says it right in the episode, quote, nothing sticks to <laughs> Teflon Don. <laughs> Is that what he said? Yeah, he says. He says that's his nickname, Teflon Don. Teflon Don. I, I never heard anyone say that before, but I'll trust him. <laughs> but it is it is a fun scene i like it because you know skanky's obviously like uh, well, how did you do all these weird superhuman things and then nick just takes him aside just like starts glamoring and he's just like hey skanky you didn't see anything there's no flying happening you're being you're being hypnotized and then as he finishes up he's like oh yeah would you wash my car today for me <laughs> yeah a couple things for that one apparently nick's a bit of a dickhead because why would you make him wash your car like that seems like an abuse of your vampire powers just saying and the second thing is, how many times do you think he's actually glamoured uh, uh, Skanky? Because we see a few times that, like, he's done it, o- you know, over the course of their partnership, he's done it a few times because I'm assuming, like, he's slipped. He's done something that has unintentionally revealed his vampire uh, uh, nature. But 
it, is it just that he's like really sloppy and he just like oh yeah oh whoops i showed you a, a vampire thing again anyways you saw nothing while you're reading a sub yeah i think there's an implication there because i got the feeling that the reason the glamoring is sort of slipping this episode is he's just done it too many times there's just too many like inconsistencies in Skanky's own memory around his partner mm. that it's causing sort of like a, a feedback loop in his mind. That's why he can't kind of get past the shooting is that every time he has to think about it while writing his report, he's just like, that doesn't add up. Like these things don't add up anymore. And the more he thinks about it, the more things he thinks about that don't add up with Nick. I think that's sort of the idea is that like maybe Nick's done it one too many times. Well, I think there's, there's an interesting idea there that this show doesn't lean into enough. This idea of like what you could actually do to someone to kind of, for better or worse kind of mess them up because you've you're changing the history in their mind over and over and over and i think there's something interesting and they kind of take an easy way out at the end of this episode where they're just like hey, everything's fine and this is why which i thought oh you guys had something kind of interesting but you just didn't want to go with it which maybe is not fair i really liked that as skanky's thinking about it i think he's talking to dr nat about it at some point and he's just like something's weird about my my partner nick and I, he has a great line here where he says he's just like he's always the first one in he quote Hits every beach like it's Normandy. <laughs> yeah, you would you ever would you ever use that as an expression? Like you're like, uh, uh, it's like you know that uh, that guy uh, Gary, as your friend Gary, like he hits that cheese like uh, people on the beach in Normandy. It's a good it's a good uh, <laughs> analogy. It's a nice. I, it was a real like uh, film noir kind of like 1940s like detective. He's like that guy hits yeah. every beach like it's Normandy. Yeah, that is good. <laughs> anyway, this basically gets. Skanky to start investigating. And as you've said, everyone he asks questions about are all concerned that, uh, about his mental health, about Skanky yeah. having trouble with the shooting. But Skanky's just like, no, no, no. Something's going on. And he, he gets out a piece of paper and he starts, he starts making his, uh, his list of why Nick might be, <laughs> might be weird, might be, something, might be something he's not telling about. And he writes down, he's like, Nick's associates. And he writes down only one name, Jeanette. He only knows one person that Nick knows. He's like, well, I better head over to the Raven and see what's going on. And it's very funny. Nick drives over the Raven and seems confused and surprised the nightclub is not open during the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like he goes and he's like, where is everyone? It's like, well, it's like it's like two o'clock in the afternoon. There's no one there. Yeah, no one's here. It's a it's a nightclub skanky. <laughs> but because Nick needs uh, skanky to wash his car later, skanky has Nick's keychain. So he has a, he has a he has a key to the door for some reason to the Raven. So he's able to get inside. Yeah. Why does Nick have access to the Raven? They're just that good friends. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're basically brother and sister. They they hang out all the time. I mean, you you don't have the keys to my place. I, well, we're not that good friends, my friend. <laughs> we're not vampire friends. <laughs> we haven't lived at two hundred years and met the same child actors. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Again, you're right. <laughs> you only met those child actors, not me. <laughs> <laughs> I've been holding them from you. But while he's inside the club, sort of poking around, he finds a he finds a chest and he opens it up, and uh, inside are like old photos of uh, Nick and Jeanette and Lacroix uh, from like you know hundreds of years ago, not hundreds, but like a hundred at least, because photography only goes back a hundred years at this point. But he can see like there's just photos of them from a long time ago, and he's just like, what's this? And he has a weird flashback where then he's also at the club, also doing a weird dance with a lady. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, uh, let me just venture though. He finds um, it's Lacroix or uh, Lacroix. I, I don't. We have to decide on something. It's it's his like eight by ten glossy. It's like his headshot, which Nick also has. When did he get these done? Because I I know you said they like there's an old picture of them all together, but he also sees just like his headshot. Is it just for roles he's going out for? Oh no, that's a that's a that's a uh, DJ Nightcrawler headshot. That's a more recent photo of uh, of old uh, right. Lacroix. <laughs> Right, I did. I you know what? You're right. It's his DJ. It's his DJ photo. But um, am I wrong? I thought vampires couldn't get uh, like wouldn't show up in photographs. They do in this universe. I guess they do in this universe. You're right. That is typically a rule, but I guess not in this universe. They've they've thrown that out the window this time. It's a good question. Mirrors? Does do they have a mirror problem in this universe that hasn't come up yet? Yeah, because we. I know we. It, photos aren't a problem because Nick way back when when that. Uh, uh, that uh, museum curator was into him. There was a picture. She saw a picture of him too, and he was like, I don't know. 200 years ago exploring or something that's right that's right so that's not mythology here for sure but yeah. yes he finds these old photos and he's just looking at them being like this is weird these people they look like they're so in an old-timey photo but i know them from today and of course jeanette then re appears out of the shadows it's a nice shot like she comes out she has glowing red eyes and she's just like floating through the shadows towards skanky let me just mention real quick skanky uh this episode and i don't know if it was because they were short in the episode everything he sort of discovers he repeats it about three or four times and the worst part is when uh, later on in a few scenes later he's gonna be reading about vampires and it's like 
skanky you gotta like you're so slow in the uptake he just keeps saying he's like wait a minute nightclub are they vampires it's late at night maybe they're vampires i don't know what about this drinking blood hmm vampires drinking blood i'm like skanky just just get to it man that's him man he's a little slow in the uptake he's a good detective but he's a little slow <laughs> i guess but anyway, he finds these photos. Jeanette appears out of the shadows. And when she talks to Skanky, she just like assures him everything's on the up and up. Those are just photos of her grandma and Nick's grandpa hanging out 100 years ago. Nothing to worry about. And I was just like, if this were me, if I were a vampire and someone found a photo of me from like 1910, I would just be like, oh, we were down at that fun photo place by the wharf where you dress up in old clothes and get an old timey photo. Like that's how I would have solved it. That's a better excuse. You've got a better excuse. Also, but like, shouldn't you like, one, try to avoid getting photos taken of you as a vampire? And two, if there are photos, you don't need those. Don't keep them. Jordan, do you not have photos that you keep as memories? <sighs> Little photo album keepsakes? One, not of vampires. And two, uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> There's no photos of your parents or your siblings in your home? Uh, just like just on the wall? Yeah, just around to remind you of your loving family. Not really. Do you have those? <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep a couple photos of the of the nieces and nephews on the fridge. Is that right? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I have a couple of those. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone from your family's listening, you definitely have them. <laughs> yeah, I definitely have those. They're framed. <laughs> At any rate, Jeanette then proceeds to attempt to glamour him into dropping the investigation as well. But as we know, this is this is not going to work. There's too many questions um, uh, because as as he's trying to glamour him, I can't remember exactly where this falls, but she's glamouring him about dropping the investigation. And I think somewhere in this area, Skanky then has a flashback of the time that Nick chased down a city bus, climbed on top of it, and leapt off the top of a city bus. And I'm just like, uh, I guess this is him remembering like this doesn't make sense. <laughs> Yeah, there's something kind of funny again that like if you, if this episode was maybe a little more fun, they would have kind of like played with it a little bit, like the sort of lunacy of this. Because yes, it's like wait a minute, wasn't there also a time where he did something like insane, and he's like just remembering these things now? I'm like, what would what would his actual memory be if he if that's you know what actually happened? It was just like Nick happened to drive in front of the car or something. But anyways, it's yeah, we we see an insane episode where Nick was on top of a bus stopping. <laughs> The whole thing is just that his brain is getting more and more kind of mushy by all these glamourings he's getting yeah. from these vampires. And he leaves the club. He's confused. He's not quite sure why he's at the Raven. And a traffic cop is outside giving giving him a ticket for parking Nick's car illegally. So Nick, ha- so he has to go and dig through Nick's glove compartment to try to get the registration to give to this traffic cop. And while he's doing it, he finds an old New York City driver's license from the 50s where uh, Nick was a goateed man named Nicholas Foster. Yeah, a couple questions. One, uh, why does Nick keep that in his car? His like because it was so long ago, he wouldn't have had that vehicle, so he would have had to have taken that and put it into his car, which doesn't make any sense. Uh, secondly, can traffic cops ask you for insurance and stuff? It seems like out of their purview. Yeah, it's a good question. It's just a parking ticket. I don't think they need to see your registration for this. Well, they, yeah, they ask him for it, and I was like, just tell you, go away, go give another ticket, you you loser. Well, it's funny too because he shows as like he shows him his detect his murder detective badge, and I'm just like, I think that just gets you out of the ticket, right? Yeah, but apparently it doesn't because then he's all he's all he feels bad. He's like, don't tell Nick I got a ticket. I'm like, okay, well, uh, that, I don't think Nick's gonna be that upset. He's been glamoring you for ten years, but anyway, Skanky's such an honest cop. He's gonna pay that ticket. He's not gonna use his powers to like get out of it. His privilege. <laughs> Would you pay that ticket if I were Skanky? Yeah. No, I'd abuse my That's... power like crazy. <laughs> Oh, no, I pay the ticket. <laughs> <laughs> What's the point of being a cop if you're not going to abuse that power, Jordan? I suppose. I suppose. I, I Let me just say, this traffic cop is definitely abusing her power because asking for an insurance for a p- parking ticket is an abuse of power. <laughs> but yes, Skanky has found this crazy driver's license from the 50s with a photo of Nick, and he's like, he cannot figure out what's happening. He's sitting back at his desk. He's got that loosely piece of paper where he's just writing down all the weird things about Nick. Hypnotizing. Flying question mark? Blood in his fridge? Driver's yeah. license from the fifties? Again, we've mentioned that maybe Skanky's a little slow, but like literally I understand that like in this universe like anything, if you actually thought someone was a vampire, it seems so outlandish. How could it be true? But like if everything is pointing to it, it just was funny. It's just like he's like, Oh, weird. Wears capes? Speaks in a funny accent? Is from Transylvania? You're like, This is weird. It's like, come on, man. I think we all know where this is going. 
it makes for the best gag of the scene of the of the episode though because he's staring at this photo with all these things written on it and some cop walks by looks down and sees his list and is like makes a joke she's just like sounds like your suspect might be a vampire and then it like zooms on skanky's face as his head, mind explodes i was like this yeah. is so funny well, because what we are as an audience supposed to know is that Skanky doesn't know anything about vampires. Because when later on he reads a book called, what is it, Legends of the Undead, he's literally getting the basic information that we as children know about vampires. Like, drinks blood, is allergic to the sun. He's like, stake through the heart. I'm like, Skanky, like, how, how do you not know this? It is very funny because they literally cut from that scene where the cop says, what are you looking for a vampire? And he's sitting at his desk with like, piles of books about vampires there's no way he's reading like 17 volumes on vampires but he's sitting there looking at it and it's it's so good i love it so much the camera just pushes in on him in one of those push pulls where the background moves and hit like and you know yeah. classic spielberg push pull and they're cutting to like scenes of like nick flying and nick drinking blood and like nick doing vampire things and like the actor skanky his face is just getting more and more his eyes are wider and wider and his mind is being blown i'm just like this is such a funny reveal for his like putting all the pieces together yeah but but it, yeah it, and so they have sort of have a flashback for every single sort of vampire ability is what we see that, that's what he's kind of catching up on yeah it's a very funny sequence i loved it and uh skanky gets up from his desk goes to nick's desk and starts rifling through it looking for more of clues i guess and what he finds is he finds a signed headshot by dj nightcrawler and he's just like i better go see this dj nightcrawler because he clearly has a connection to nick and maybe he can explain why i think he's a vampire <laughs> Yeah, which again is this just so so bizarre that I get what else is LaCroix going to be doing? I guess is he needs a job, but it's just so bizarre that that's what he does. He's this like public figure. It's such a great choice. I love the idea that he's just like a nighttime DJ. It's so funny to me, a vampire nighttime DJ. Hilarious. I mean, it makes sense. At any rate, it's around this time the sun is going down. Nick's waking up. He's getting ready to start his day, and as he gets out of bed, he turns around. Jeanette's in his home. Dr. Nat's at his door. They're both just in his apartment being like, hey, listen, I think Skanky's figured it out. Yeah. Like, it's, it, things are getting bad while you've been sleeping. Why'd you sleep so long? Skanky put it all together over the course of 18 hours. It is funny, though, as a star of the show, how little he's in this episode. He's sort of like top and tail. Like, he's just at the beginning, and then at this end part, he's there. But, like, he has very little to do in this episode. Yeah, it's a light. It was a light week for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But anyway, let's stay with Skanky. He's headed off. He's going to CRTK, the home of the Nightcrawler, hoping to uh, have a little chat with LaCroix. <laughs> oh, quick. What do you think uh, LaCroix wrote in his uh, little headshot? What was his little, like, catchy thing? Mm, good question. Good question. Um, glad I made you, Nick. Something like that. Mm, mine was this. It was bloody good to meet you. Oh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah. Maybe it would be something about how he wishes he'd drink more blood or something. But then maybe that works, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, you've really uh, satisfied my thirst. That doesn't work. Anyways, mm, someone come up with bad. something. Not bad. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, LaCroix meets Skanky, and he's very welcoming. He lets he lets Skanky hang out while he's doing his radio show. They're just sitting there as, as LaCroix just, you know, hamming it up on the radio. And when he puts a song on, they, they have a little conversation and, uh, you know, have a chat about all the weird things Skanky's noticed about Nick and Skanky's like kind of like eh, do you think do you think he might be a vampire uh, DJ Nightcrawler and I guess what we're supposed to get out of this is I'm not 100% sure if LaCroix is glamoring him or just talking him out of thinking Nick's a vampire maybe it's a little bit of both because what we see is LaCroix just asks Skanky a bunch of questions just about like the trauma of last night the trauma of shooting a man whether he might be confused about it and skanky kind of talks himself out of the vampire idea and what we see is actually jeanette and nick are like peeking from behind a curtain kind of watching it all happen and like looking back and forth at each other like our master's good look at him work he's really talking this skanky guy out of this and uh just going back to it i think he should have wrote <laughs> written i just i was thinking of puns <laughs> while you're talking it, it was fantastic to meet you mm, it's getting worse i think <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was getting better. It's fantastic. <laughs> Do you not get it? I liked I liked bloody good to meet you. Was I think that was the height. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. But as I was saying, what was I saying, Jordan? He he, he wrote down on his on his eight by ten. I wish you all the success. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
Oh my god, where I'm so lost now. What was going on? He's he's talking to he's talking to Lacroix. And Lacroix is chatting to him while they're at a table, and he's gonna convince him that he doesn't think he's a vampire. Oh right, right. Do you think this is my question? That's right. This is my question. <laughs> Is he glamoring him or is he just like smooth talking him out of thinking this? Or is it a little bit of both? I didn't think he was glamoring him for the reason that we've sort of established that uh, the glamoring was sort of the problem was that it had sort of messed him up because it had given him too many histories, uh, too many mm. memories. Um, and I think this was just almost more of a um, a therapy session. He just didn't sort of need to talk to someone. But unfortunately, the person who was talking to him sort of had an agenda. So he was guiding him to the answers he wanted to have i think it was actually just a conversation that was how i felt right 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 and i guess and i guess so i guess that is the point it's just like because he's an ancient vampire he's a lot better at this than the other two he's like he's able to talk skanky out of it just without the powers yeah and i i do you bet you though them watching from the wings it is funny though it's like i I don't know it it just felt like a, a relationship maybe it's because we haven't seen the episodes but it was a relationship we hadn't really seen them before where they were like kind of like a team where they're just like look at him go he's just the best vampire i mean you can't deny it he is the best vampire he is yeah (laughs) i mean he's your favorite yeah i mean i would say he's fantastic (laughs) (laughs) at any rate this is sort of the wrap up is now skanky has given up on this idea that nick's a vampire we we everything that was done has been undone in the episode and we cut to skanky washing nick's car in the sunlight just like like he's at a car wash on the street just rubbing it down just thanking his good partner for saving his life last night yeah and it's supposed to be like isn't it cute but again i'm like nick's a jerk for making him clean his car (laughs) uh it's very funny to me that a vampire abuses his powers that way yeah well there we are and that's and that's the pseudo clip show there you go well, John, before we get into ratings, uh, mm-hmm. I, I have a little final note for you here. And uh, sure. it's, it's related to something from way back in the pilot. And a listener who goes by Simply Maria C., uh, she sent us a little trivia about Nick the Vampire and his ability to fly. Okay. Because as we saw in the pilot, there was a bit of wire work that was done where he flew out of the sky to attack that uh, man with a submachine gun, I believe. I remember, yeah, he threw through the window and and, and uh, Skanky was like, makes sense to me. <laughs> and we've never really, like, we've seen... The implication of him flying, but we've never really seen any wire work since the pilot. I guess that's true. Yeah, it's a lot of like close-ups of him. Well, uh, simply Maria C. let us know that apparently in the pilot, when he was hung up, sort of flying through the alleyway, uh, they nearly dropped him. And so uh, <laughs> the actor said, "No more wire work for the rest of the series. I'm not doing it. You guys can't be trusted." So everything has always been implied till now. And honestly, I hadn't really thought about it. I, but uh, it's very funny to think this is like they nearly killed the actor on the first day, and he's like, "I'm not doing that again. We're gonna do three more scenes, and I'm never getting up on wires." I mean, I think that's fair. I think that's a fair like, no, no more. You guys aren't safe. It's good to know when to throw your weight around. Even in the pilot, you're like, I'm the star of this, and I'm never getting back on wires again. Just deal with it. Right, Work around it. Do you think if they gave him a loaded weapon, he would have shot it? Oh, Jordan. <laughs> Too soon? Alec Baldwin uh, <laughs> jokes that way are, uh, I don't know. I don't know if they're ready yet. <laughs> We're not ready, yeah? Yeah. September 11th? No? Those are different things, Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's not what you called. All right, Jordan, why don't we get into ratings for these episodes? Um, I'll start us off. I'll start us off. I know this has been tough for you, Jordan, and I, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm very sorry that it's been a, a rough a rough <laughs> go for you. The more episodes of this we watch, I'll be honest, I am falling in love with these characters. I love spending oh, time with man. them. It's I have a good time now every time I tune in because I want to see what Skanky's up to. I want to see what mm-hmm. Nick's up to. I, I mean, I'm having a nice time. And... I thought the, it was a fun episode. I love the idea that an apocalypse is happening. The world's falling apart. People are just being murdered left and right everywhere you look. And then they go off and solve a stock uh, a stock option problem. Like there's a problem with the stock market around mm-hmm. an asteroid. All of that's very funny to me. This is a seven. This is a great time. I had a blast seven. Yeah, it's you know what's funny? Talking about it's not so bad. And I, and while we're, while we're discussing, I sort of like... I go, oh, is my is my rating too low? Is it is it? Am I being too hard? And then I remember watching it. We just have very different experiences. I watch it, and it's just time just stops. Like you could just see drops, like just floating in air before they hit the ground. It's just the slowest 
most boring show. I'm trying to think of a show I found more boring that we watched. I, I, I have to go back through the list. It just, it's so boring to me. I was going to give it a three to 10 because you liked it so much. I'm dropping it down to a two to 10. Two out of 10. Two to wow. 10. Punishing yeah. it for my I hated enjoyment. It. <laughs> yeah, I have to. I'm sorry. I've been so nice to this show and it's, and it's only it resulted in my punishment. It's a great show. I like it more the more we watch it. I like um so much. In it's love not with a great it. show. It's not a great show. It is. Show. I really like it. Oh, it's such a bad show. It's on. It's a bad, bad show. To that point, we'll get to Close Call, which I enjoyed getting to spend an episode with Skanky. He's fun. Yeah. I have a great time with him. I love I love all his foibles. I would say I'm going to knock down half a point on my rating, though. I was a little disappointed that they did, like, cop out and not let him know Nick's a vampire. I would have been, I was happy for him to finally figure it out. I was, like, into this idea. So I'm only going to go 6.5. I, I, it, we're having just such a different experiences. It's amazing. So I was going to give this one a 1 out of 10, and I can't get any lower, so I'm just going to give it a 0. 0.5 out of 10 because you liked it so much. 0. 0. 0.5. It was terrible. Wow, you're really you're really getting out of this show. <laughs> I, I just... Well, we, we can't. I think the score is too high. I think your your ratings are too high. There's no way we're getting out. I don't know, Jordan. I think you uh, you gave us some really good attempts <laughs> to get us out of here. So let's pull up the old <laughs> escape pod and find out. I mean, 0. 0.5 is pretty low. I mean, it's... It's a pretty low rating. That's going to drop that down quite a bit. And honestly, and I know I know it seems like I'm being mean, but like someone else tried watching this thing. That was one of the worst episodes of television. It was terrible. Terrible. I I don't know what you're watching, man. This is a great time. Mm, yeah. We'll just agree to disagree. I just I'm assuming you had some sort of head injury at some point during the week. All right, Jordan, I've punched it into the Continuum Drag computer. Are you ready? Okay. Is, I, well, I want to know if this is a, what, what is it, what was the title? Is, is this a more permanent hell for me or is it a semi-permanent? <laughs> you've done it, Jordan. You've ended, you've ended Forever Night. It's 4.8. Thank goodness. Let's get out of here. Well, we'll take the escape pod. We'll be back next week for the finale of Forever Night. One last episode. Jordan has saved three additional episodes on it for himself. <laughs> Well, you know, it's something. That's three hours of my life. We'll be going back to this, I think, though. There's one episode we're missing that the fans really wanted us to cover, and I have a feeling we'll be back before long. Oh, no. Please, please don't do it. I mean, I'll do it for charity, (laughs) but please, I'm begging you, don't make me. (laughs) (laughs) But that's it, I guess, for Forever Night. We're going to take the escape pod. We'll wrap it up. We'll see what's happening at the end of Season 3. We'll miss all of Season 3, unfortunately. So uh, we'll only get to see the finale of the series Forever Night. We'll see what hair Skanky has. That'll be the only difference. There's no character development in this show. <laughs> that was nice in the flashbacks. You got to see all the variations on his hair. That's true. I'll give him that. That was the 0.5. <laughs> it's the 0.5. But as we've mentioned previously, and even a little tease in this episode, we have bonus episodes for charity. So if you want us to go back and watch a show we've taken the escape pod out of, just like we've done today, you can uh, do a little donation to a charity as selected by our former guests, you can find a list of those on our website, continuumdrag.podbean.com, or via social media. You can follow the links there. And if there's a charity you'd like to give a little bit of money to, we'll go back. We'll watch an episode of a show we've taken the escape pod from, so we haven't finished every episode of it, and we'll get a little more of that series, whether it be Forever Night, whether it be Project UFO, maybe it's Misfits of Science. There's lots of choices there. You can find a Forever list Night's on the website, Forever Night's not included, too. I don't think. Yeah, you don't think so? <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> I think we're safe. Jordan doesn't know the password to the website, so we're safe. He'll be up there. <laughs> and uh, that's just a way to get us to go back and wa- do a little bonus episode for you if there's an episode you want us to cover that we haven't had a chance to. So uh, have a look at the website for more details there. Or email us at continuedreg at gmail.com. If you have any questions about how to do this, because I know this explanation was a little little haphazard, I'm happy to walk you through what, what we're planning here. Um, but that's, that's how you can get a little bonus episode for yourself. Uh, other than that, though, we're going to have some clips from these episodes of Forever Night. I think I have probably nearly t- 14 clips from these episodes. There's so many great wow. clips. I've got too many. Wow, really? And are there just clips of, of uh, 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 Skanky remembering things? No, definitely some skanky remembering things. There's all kinds of great clips from these episodes. You'll see those on social media. Their uh, handle is at Continuum Drag, and that's on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. So you can see that there more. But that about wraps it up. We'll come back next week for one last episode of Forever Night. Yeah. But, listener, thank you for joining us. And, Jordan, I'll see you next week. See you then. Continuum Drag is recorded in Toronto, Ontario, and Seoul, South Korea. Theme music by James Rick Seidler. 
produced by Jordan Dalek and Luke Black. Special thanks to Aaron Younes.